and welcome back to the Summoner's Guide to Final Fantasy XIV. This time we're going to take on the level 55 story dungeon, known as the Airy, the lair of the great worm Nidhogg, and a rather significant part of the story. As with the previous couple dungeons, it has a two-level range, so it sinks to level 56. The new ability that we earn at level 56 is Tri Disaster. Tri Disaster is an ability that's instant cast with a one-minute cooldown, and uh, it immediately inflicts the highest level of bio and miasma that you have available onto your target as well as an ability called Ruination, which increases your potency of your Ruin spells against said target for a brief period of time. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> Nidhogg's pretty pissed off. intro. Hope my party isn't too upset that I watched the whole thing. But hey, they're getting a the bonus out of this. Alright, so for this first section of the dungeon, there's going to be a random lightning bolts hitting the ground, like right there. Don't get hit by them. It does make life a little interesting when you are, uh, when you're tanking. Alright, so you'll notice I opened that particular battle. Instead of using my normal Miasma and Bio combo, I just opened it right up with Tri Disaster, instantly inflicted the two status effects, and then instantly baned onto the other. This makes your combo so much quicker, as you don't have to worry about the casting time for your Bio and Miasma combo. You're just going to immediately get those dots onto your target. Now, it has a one-minute cooldown, so you're not going to be able to do it for every group unless, there, unless a minute passes in between pulls. So, you'll just have to do the normal, uh, you'll just have to do the, yeah, the, the normal bio and miasma for those circumstances. But still, having that ability really does uh, speed the process along, giving you plenty of time to do other things like painting and throwing your shadow flare down. But the limiting factor, of course, as always, is the minute cooldown now on Tri Disaster, but as well on your Ether Flow. As those abilities are very powerful, they're going to do a lot of damage, but the cooldown is going to make it's going to make it so you can't always be unleashing all those extremely powerful attacks. Yeah, the one minute cooldown is really what limits the power of the summoner really from here to the end. Because the summoner has some powerful attacks going forward. They're all locked behind that one minute cooldown. Usually the one minute cooldown for ether flow. And then of course pain flare or not not pain flare, try disaster and shadow flare have their own one minute cooldowns you have to worry about too. So yeah, standard trash pulls here. I don't know that a lot of tanks really make a lot of big pulls in this particular section. I, I know when, when I have tanked this, I do not. Um, 
the lightning strikes make it tough enough to have to worry about without making enormous holes along with it. up on the first boss. Yes, there is the there is the purple border. So summon her two step, get her get Garuda around the corner. Alright. So this guy you definitely don't want to get too far away. Staying in mid-range is gonna help make sure that you're able to deal with all of his mechanics. And what are these mechanics? Well, first off, electric k k k uh, However you pronounce that, you want to get in the point-blank range. Then it'll use an ability there, Ionospheric Charge. And it's going to start casting lightning bolts. And if you see yourself get hit by the first AoE, you're going to get hit by a bunch of AoEs. As a caster, this is extremely annoying. Okay, Electrocution is a knockback. I'd forgotten about that. So as soon as you get the knockback, run into the middle to keep get from getting wrecked by Electric Gaga. I think it's usually the DPS that get targeted by the Ionospheric Charge. When add to peer, kill them. They're easy enough to kill. It seems to me there's a mechanic that involves those statues. It's been a while since I played this, so I don't remember. Ah, see, I didn't move in time for that one. Yeah, that tether that was on the uh, healer, I think you can run that tether into one of these statues. Similar to the uh, first boss of... Uh, Oh, which one was it? Um, and poor key part mode. Alright. Yeah, there. That purple tether, you run it into a statue. There you go. So that's really all the mechanics you have to worry about. Run in for the electric keki keki keki. If you get a tether, run it into a statue. And dodge, dodge, dodge. And as a caster, you're probably going to do a lot of dodging when Ionospheric Charge comes up. Now, I believe once that boss is down, you don't have to worry about those random lightning bolts anymore because that boss is what was causing the random lightning bolts. Jump off the cliff! As this is a forced jump, you don't take any damage from it. Alright. Don't get too eager to run forward here. Now you can go. Alright, so all depends on how the tank pulls things here. And the tank is going to be pulling things away from the slumbering dragon. See, these Nidhogg broodlings, when they die, they will use a final attack that will basically. It'll, it'll basically be a shriek that will uh, wake up the dragon. Yeah, there it is. Final yip. 
Bam! If that thing hits the slumbering dragon, the dragon will wake up. If you walk too close to the dragon, the dragon will wake up. If you don't like wake the dragon up, you don't have to fight it. I decided to only take the one enemy there, and I can understand that. I consider this to be one of the toughest rooms to pull in the entire dungeon. Uh, that dragon, it just all, the, all these the AoE attacks from these enemies are just trouble. Double back and go up here. Now there should be a couple more pulls here involving the Nidhogg Broodlings and the Slumbering Dragons. And again, we've got a we've got a tank that's playing very conservatively, uh, which is fine because I really don't I really don't like to have to deal with the Slumbering Dragons if, if it's possible to avoid them, and it's very possible to avoid them. Why am I not using Pain Flare? Just making sure the dragon didn't wake up. He didn't. That's good. Now again, here you can pull the Broodlings back. Or you can, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, tanks I've seen will actually pull it forward into the next hallway. No, no, there. <laughs> I, get, I almost uh, sent Garuda off after the dragon. That would not have been good. second boss is all about poison, and we will get into the mechanics shortly here. This is probably supposed to be some weird distorted reference to the uh, Serpent of Genesis Chapter 3 considering the two of his attacks are called Fall of Man and Original Sin. But what you mainly gotta worry about in this uh, battle are those poison clouds. And for every poison cloud that is up, the boss is going to be buffed. How do you get rid of the poison clouds? Well, that ad that just appeared, the mustard gas, is gonna eat the clouds. Every cloud it eats is gonna make it more powerful but will also clear the cloud from the field. The general rule of thumb is to let the mustard gas eat two clouds, not step into the poison like an idiot, and as soon as he eats two, then take him down. Wow, our Dragoon just took him down right as he hit number two. That's incredibly convenient. But yeah, that, doing this will, will basically keep a balance between not letting the ad get too big, but also making sure that the ad clears out the 
Uh, oh, he didn't let him finish eating Cloud. Okay, maybe he doesn't know that mechanic. This could get a little hairy. Alright, we got one. Let's let him eat one more. I'm not playing this sufficiently as I could. I'm paying way too much attention to what's going on with the with the mustard gas. Let him eat one more before you kill him. So yeah, it really is all about maintaining that balance between not letting the uh, the ad grow so big that it explodes and hurts everybody, and letting him eat enough of the uh, enough of the clouds that it reduces the buff on the on the boss. All right, so here in the third section. It's just going to be a bunch of scattered uh, trash poles here. And you'll notice a lot of the uh, scenery kind of dropping around us, which will open up the various other sections of the, uh, of the last section of the dungeon as we go. So that, that does kind of gate uh, a lot of the Pulls so that you really can't make an enormous pull here. Not that you really want to make too big of pulls in these leveling dungeons. Uh, <clears throat> because you're generally not going to be terribly overgeared or over leveled due to the sinking issues and the fact that they're only sinking to two levels. You're not going to want to be quite as bold with your pulls as you would running a level 50 or level 60 dungeon with top-level gear. Alright, let's do that. The only caster gear I've seen is a uh, is an accessory. All right, only a couple more pulls to worry about here. By the time we get to the next pull, my ether pull will be refreshed. Still got about 25 seconds, though. So it's probably not going to happen. Alright, so only one more pull before the boss. This room is basically going to have you fighting wave after wave of various wyverns and small dragons.
Okay, I am gonna get my ether flow back. Alright. I'm waiting on Tri Disaster because I know what's coming. Drop that. So yeah, just a bunch of just a bunch of ants coming out and shifts. The, uh, the Voivre, or however you pronounce these, are the tougher ones. The Down Wyverns all die pretty quick. As you kill the ants, those little red things will turn green. Pain Flare does wonders against those groups. All right, once all the enemies are down, you'll be free, and you'll know, you'll know that all because all those things will be green and there won't be anything attacking you. Now it's time to fight Nidhogg himself. This is a somewhat complicated fight, and if you don't know what you're doing, you will probably wipe. So pay close attention. Uh, these mechanics are important. Okay, so the Dragoon doesn't know this fight. The Reader's Digest version of the mechanics of this fight. Kill all ads ASAP, get an Astidian shield when it generates. Alright, here we go. Now I'm going to give you the more uh, extensive version of this uh, mechanics in a moment here. So, yeah. A lot of dodging. Alright, when he uses the Scarlet Prize, he'll look at somebody. If it's you, get out of the way. Now, those uh, fireballs will do a line AoE. Don't be in it. So far, so good. Try to stay close enough to the group for AoE heals, because there's going to be some AoE attacks to worry about. Eventually, he's going to use an attack called the Sable Price, and that's where you got to be—that's where you got to be careful. The Sable Price will bind a player and will eventually kill the player, so you need to kill it before that happens. Which is why I'm kind of holding off on my Pain Player and my Dry Disaster because that's going to happen. Just if he's looking at you during the Scarlet Price.
Alright, so at this point, the ads are mainly going to focus on Astinian. You don't want Astinian to die. If Astinian dies, you win. Astinian is going to put up a shield. And that shield is going to prevent, or is, is going to keep you alive when the, uh, when Nidhogg's ultimate goes off. So these ads must die. Now, if you're a healer, you should be healing Astinian. Now, if you're a tank, you're going to find it very difficult to tank these guys. A lot of these guys will just simply can't be tanked. They will, uh, they are, they're programmed to go after Astinian. So again, this is why if you're the healer, Okay, so once everything's down, Astinian puts up his shield, you get in the shield. You wait. When that attack hits, then the fight with Nidhogg will resume. From here on out, it's all the same mechanics you saw in the first phase. Okay, Sable Price. I don't know if it's gonna get if it's gonna get killed in time. Okay, I think they're gonna get it. I hope they get it. Yeah, they got it just in time. If, yeah, if Sable Weave goes off before the Sable Price dies, the person who is trapped dies. And that's all, folks. So that's all you need to know about the Airy. Again, a trickier dungeon than you may have seen up to this point, but nothing too big. But you gotta know those mechanics against Nidhogg. Uh, if you screw up Sable Weave, or if you screw up the Ad Phase and let Astinian die, it's, uh, it, it's a wipe. Aw, oh, sweet! So for all the caster gear I didn't get in this dungeon, I got the I got the summoner weapon. Nice. Well, that was much uh, much needed. Okay, so when we come back, the continuation of the story. I'm gonna keep working my way through to unlock uh, the level 67 dungeon, the vault, and the level 67 trial, uh, which is uh, Bismarck. And then after that, I should have access to most of the areas in the expansion and be able to actually unlock my level 60 abilities, because I'm about to hit level 60, but I don't think I can unlock the level 60 ability until I can get to Dravanian Interlands. So, the journey to the, journey to the end of Heaven's Word continues, and until then, have a great day. Yeah, yeah, dead hog. We know you hate humans and Ellison and all those. But that's for a later time. Until then, have a wonderful day.